Welcome in everyone. So sorry for the little delay here at the beginning while we are getting our decks in a row, but we are so thrilled as we always are that you're choosing to spend your hour with us this week. I'm Kate Westfall with Global Ag Investing, and this is part of our GAI webinar series, which actually kicked off with the brilliant minds of CoBank, and um, we are so thrilled to have them back. It was at the end of April last time we heard from this group. Um, we, we have a new addition today as well. We have Tanner with us, which we're thrilled about um, to cover the grain industry, but we are going to do a similar uh, trajectory to our conversation from the end of April um, and take you all through where we are today in the ag economy um, as we stand with the ongoing pandemic. Um, so I'm going to kick off to Dan Kowalski um, to begin our presentation. Please add your questions into the Q&A chat and at the end when we're doing the discussion portion I'll get to as many as I can. Um, so just pop them in there and I will, um, I will pay attention to you and, and do the best I can with those. Okay, I am going to share my screen and let Dan uh, kick off with his presentation. Dan, thanks so much for being here again with us. Great, well, thank you, Kate. Thanks everybody else for joining. Uh, good afternoon to all those in Mountain Time or East and to those on the West Coast, good morning. Um, it's a great honor for us to be back and to talk about what we've been thinking about uh, related to COVID and how it's affecting the economy and the agricultural sectors. Uh, I'm sure it's been as busy for you as it's been for us the last two or three months since we were together. A whole lot has changed. Uh, some things haven't changed so much. Some things have gone around, come around. Uh, but we're going to try and make sense of that a little bit today. What's going on with with the virus, what's going on with the impacts to the general economy and the ag sector. So, so without further ado, let's, let's jump right in. Um, so Kate, you're going to advance slides, is that right? Dan, you should have control at this point if you click into it. Okay. Let's see if that works. All right, looks like it's working. Great. Great. Okay, so bad news first. We got bad news this morning. Uh, we hit another record high in cases yesterday uh, on June 7th, or July 7th, I should say. Let's see if I can get back to that chart. Just like hurry up and wait. There you go. Uh, so here we are again. Uh, when I look at this chart, I definitely get the sense that we are in wave two. Uh, it's hard to not think that that we are are not, um, given that this has been going on for the last week and a half, two weeks, um, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, so this is this is going to have a real impact as we go through the rest of the summer and into the fall, uh, and it's going to have an impact regionally. Uh, I think you know if you looked at the first two three months, we were all in shutdown. Most of the rest of the, the country, the whole country is kind of dealing with the same thing. But now that we've opened up uh, and are uh, at different stages, uh, we're going to get impacted a little bit differently. So here we are. I'd like to look at uh, different maps from the week before to the week of. These are the hotspot maps. You can see an awful lot of red up in the upper left in Florida, down into Texas, a little bit in Arizona, which were the hotspot states, some in California. It started, this was July 1 was the week that we really started to see it move from the south up into the upper parts of the Midwest. It just kind of gradually moved that way. I'm not sure why, but that's what happened. Uh, if you're looking at J July 8th, what I grabbed this morning, uh, you're actually seeing a lot less red in Florida, a lot less red in Texas, and, and in most places. You're seeing a little bit more red around Pennsylvania, Ohio, but the rest of it is, is kind of uh, dimmed down a little bit to the orange. So what I would say is that the red is the worst, but the lighter orange and the mid orange, you're still expanding cases. So the the we're still we're still expanding the number of people that are getting sick. It's still rising, and so as long as the the new cases are still coming in, we should expect that more people are going to remain sick for the next two to three weeks. We'll have more hospitalizations over the next two to three weeks. Um, so this is this is not going to turn. Uh, in a demonstrably good way anytime soon. We're stuck with this for at least a little while. 
Okay, so what's going on with the with the economy? Um, it, it's interesting. We've been working through this for the last three months and always say almost every time we get data, gosh, it's almost, you know, it's good to have, but gosh, it's, it's already pretty stale. And that, that was the case again with June. We got the June jobs numbers uh, that came in, in you know, on Thursday and already we had concerns that this, this data was picked, was surveyed and put together at, at, a, at a time where it's not really reflective anymore. So we had two really good months, May and June, that were surprised to the high. Um, added a lot more people back to the jo- back to jobs in leisure and hospitality. Uh, things started really, really to look up, and we added back about a third of the jobs that we had lost. Uh, on the downside, this is a trend that we're watching and are a little concerned about that uh, more of the layoffs are not temporary; they are permanent layoffs. We saw about. Almost 90% of layoffs originally uh, back in April were, were by people that were saying, hey, I'm, my boss told me they're going to bring me back to work. Not a big deal. Uh, you know, this is very temporary. Uh, we're not hearing that as much by people that are filing now. They're getting different messages. Uh, stores are closing. Restaurants are closing. Some of those things. And so it is feeling more like a prolonged period of recession where those guarantees or those those quick, yeah, come on back to work when, when we open, uh, a, a little bit less of that's happening. And so that's concerning. Um, this, is, this is exactly why, we're, why the June data, I think, needs to be taken with a grain of salt, especially as here we are in, you know, the first, second of week, first or second week of July. Um, this is when the data was grabbed. They always grab the, the jobs data that the week that includes June 12th or the 12th of the month. <clears throat> and so, it was actually June 12th was on the, the later end of the week. So they actually pulled data pretty early in June. And you can see we were basically at the trough of or close to the trough of, uh, of the case numbers. And then just after they surveyed, we could see this, this line go, start to go back up and things got quite a bit worse. So really from June 12th to here we are July 8th, things have gotten considerably worse on the coronavirus and we don't really know yet what impact that's having on businesses, on consumers, on people that are employed. Um, and there's a lot that we just don't know. So we're following, we're following some weekly and high frequency data <clears throat> that will help us a little bit uh, to understand what's going on out there, but it's not complete. We just have kind of, you know, a few, a few images of what's happening. <clears throat> so the weekly jobless claims, this helps a little bit more. Uh, the jobless claims come out Thursday morning. So this was put out last week. These are the new people that are filing for unemployment. And you can see we stair-stepped down quite a bit really quickly in April for several weeks. And then it really started to slow down to the point where now we're just doing baby step downs for the last four weeks. We're basically stuck at 1.4 million, 1.5 million. Uh, and if you compare that to where, where we were, the worst possible week that we've had in history was back in 1982 during the recession at about 700,000 uh, people claiming for unemployment insurance. Uh, and here we are at, you know, really a, a multiple of that, double that still uh, all these weeks into it. So this is a challenge that, that people are still out there, still being laid off. This is a, a more of a rolling effect than I think a lot of economists were expecting. Um, this is also a concern. This is the other side of that coin. These are the people that have filed for insurance benefits and they've been uninsured for, for quite a while, for more than one week. Um, so you could look at this and say, okay, we peaked out of 25, we're back down to 19 and something. That's true, but we saw the biggest, the biggest drop there in early to mid May. And we've kind of been skirting around that 20 million really for the last month and a half, which is a little concerning that we're not making gains, even when the economy was opening up and things were, were doing quite, quite well. Uh, so that, that makes me concerned about what comes next is, as we have a challenge to just keep the economy open. All right, so this, this slide is really just to remind all of us that we measure recessions in years, not months. And uh, you know, this is gonna be a very different recession. You can see all the different lines and diff- different recessions going back to the 1950s. Ours now looks like you're, you're jigging for a walleye in a lake with a, a, a giant line down there with a hook. <laughs> but uh, it's eventually going to flatten out. The trajectory will change. And, and we will start to grow more, more moderately and then more modestly to uh, add jobs back. But this is gonna take an awful long time. We went really deep and we bounced back as, as you might expect initially, but
but it's not going to stay at this speed. So we're going to start to level off and, and get some more hard earned gains uh, as we go forward. So we've got a long road ahead. The CBO has confirmed that as a, and a number of other agencies and, and private forecasters. So we've got a, we've got a ways to go here. One of the things that we, this is, these are the high frequency indicators and the surveys and the things that we try and stay on top of just to figure out for our own business, for our customers' business, where where is you know where are things going especially you know we like to get a sense of how much more normalcy we'll get and when but specifically on going out to eat because it has so many implications for our business um you know as we start to see fewer and fewer people feeling comfortable going out to eat that means that we may potentially go back through one of these cycles where uh you know we we had to clear out almost in an instant uh, restaurants destroyed all the food that they couldn't use or gave it away. And then, uh, you know, we had all this problem where produce, dairy, uh, meats, all kinds of different things, uh, had nowhere to go for a while. And then you reopened, you had to restock and restaurants got going again. Do we go through that, that phase, retrace that phase one more time where, where restaurants are going to have to slow down or, or, uh, scale back considerably. So this is, you know, potentially supply chain disruptions, uh, they, are, they have been very, very disruptive. And, uh, you know, we could see more of them. So this is a concern, not only just for the general economy, but for, for anybody that's in agriculture as well. Uh, these are a couple of Gallup surveys. And, you know, Gallup is really, really buttoned down, do these statistics right. Um, really interesting stuff here, identifying that Americans are are really expecting things to get worse. And that's really popped up here in the latter part of June where people are saying, Hey, we've lost control of this. Now two thirds of people say, uh, this is going to be worse than, than, than what we thought even just a week or two ago. So people I think are mentally prepared for that. Uh, if you look down, uh, the second chart is, you know, how long is this going to persist? Is this going to go on through the end of the year and potentially into 2021? And you've got three quarters of the people out there saying, yeah, We've got to come up with a new normal because this thing is here to stay for a while. Like we're not going to kick this thing by the fall. So um, we can look at, at Europe and New Zealand and a lot of places that have done much better than we have at, at reducing their risk and getting things more back to normal. But that's not the world we're living in here. And, and we can't dream our way to it over the next couple of months. So that's the challenge that we have to accept. Um, another good indicator that we watch, the New York Fed Weekly National Economic Index, gives us a sense that things were starting to grow for back really back since uh, mid April seems to <clears throat> seems to be the bottom that a lot of people and a lot of data sets have shown. Um, and now here we are at the end of June starting to, you know, we've lost the momentum and taken a tick down. So we'll see if we keep going down or if we just flatten out here for a while until we can get the cases under control. All right, so that's kind of the macro situation. If you have questions on macro, I'll be more than happy to try and answer them as we get to Q&A. Just a couple slides on what's going on in the ag, the ag economy. Um, so 2020 is not going to be that bad. Um, this is basically taken from the FAPRI, um, the Food and Agricultural Policy Research Institute out of, this, out of um, University of Missouri. Um, they put together numbers. They're really doing numbers for Washington. They put together forecasts for the Congressional Budget Office and others. So very well relied upon, um, and, and a lot of actions are taken with these numbers in mind. So 2020, you can see we'll have record, this is already baked in, we will have record direct government payments and direct uh, record total farm support uh, here this year. So uh, we started, we started uh, the U.S. government started doing something for farmers back in 1933, whether it's supporting them with programs or direct payments. Uh, that's really when you started seeing money coming out of the USDA going back to farmers directly. Uh, so um, I think the the sum is now this is going to be the eighth largest um, effort when you look at it on a on a real basis, um, but a record number for for the, the the total dollars that are going out. So anyway, 2020 is going to be tough, but we have a big a big cushion right now because of what the U.S. government is doing trying to help out. My biggest concern is about 2021. Uh, we have an election between now and then. I don't know if the if the White House changes over. I don't know if if uh, Biden will be as sympathetic to the situation in agriculture. Uh, I also have just concerns about uh, about programs being issued out. This does seem to be quite of a cliff. 
going from 90 down to 80, marg mostly because programs would not be kicked in. Um, your MFP payments, all these different things uh, that came with the coronavirus. Uh, and my concern, and you can hear more from Tanner and Will, my concern is that prices will not bounce much from where they are now to uh, where they will be in 2021. We won't see much of a change. So that's my concern is that, that farm income is still a concern going forward for the next year. Um, ag exports, this is a little bit of a wonky chart. I wanted to do year to date for um, you know, multiple years through May for China and to the world. So you can look at 2020 and look back within that. So let's take green, what are we, what are we shipping to China in the first five months of the year? You can see what we've shipped to them, about $6 billion of all ag goods. Uh, so that's better than what we, what we did the first five months of last year, but a far cry from what we did in 2018, 2017. If you look at what we've shipped to everyone in the blue, this has just been kind of a straight line down uh, going back to 2018. So part of this is that prices are down. So the value is lower and that calculates in, this is a value chart. Um, so that's, that's definitely part of it, but it's also the strength of the dollar. It's, um, you know, trade issues, tariffs that are still on, um, plenty of supply coming out of Brazil, all those types of things, a lot of competition on the dairy side with Europe and, and Oceania, uh, on and on and on. There's a lot of competition out there, and, and our most of our commodities have not been very cheap. We have a strong dollar, which makes it, you know, makes it uh, uncompetitive in some ways. And so you can see it's come off. Uh, it was at a, a really high rate in the midst of the panic. Uh, everybody wants to hold dollars for a lot of different reasons. Um, and just it's a risk averse play, but now we've come off of that a little bit, but the dollar is still relatively strong back to where it was really um, right before COVID. So um, that's what I have. I think that's it for me. Oh, one more, one more chart. This just gives you a sense of prices. Uh, overall, this is an aggregation of agricultural prices and you can see where we were in February riding pretty high, not, not fantastic, but not terrible. And then you can see the precipitous drop that we that we found ourselves all the way down into May and then tried to stage a comeback with a little bit of corn and soybean, good news, um, and, and dairy driving prices higher. But we're not seeing everything come back. We're still seeing a fair amount of commodities that are still struggling. So anyway, I do believe that's my last one. So let me stop there and pass off to Tanner to talk about grains and uh, be happy to take questions towards the end. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Dan. And uh, I think we accidentally, here we are. All right, well, that's a great lead off with where we're at right now. <clears throat> we have, uh, for this section, we're going to focus mostly on corn, uh, but we will touch on soybeans and wheat uh, because uh, corn has been uh, disproportionately affected by what's been going on in the COVID environment since we last spoke to you in, uh, in April. A lot has happened, uh, especially with ethanol. So uh, this is a chart uh, looking at corn and soybean prices, uh, continuous front month futures going back three years. Uh, there's a lot of stories being told here. Uh, we can look at what's happened since the trade war started uh, back in uh, the middle of 2018. Uh, we saw corn prices uh, rally very sharply uh, during uh, spring last year. And we have since come down very sharply uh, but if you look at that last uh, part of what's happened in the, on the right side of the chart, uh, corn uh, futures really took a dive uh, because of what was happening directly with the economy and fuel consumption and ethanol. And we have still yet to come back to those uh, pre-COVID levels. But as you can see there, uh, what I have circled in uh, red, uh, corn and soybean prices are recovering. Now, what is driving this? Part of it is that ethanol uh, production is recovering somewhat. And we're gonna take another look at that uh, here in another chart. But we have other factors now influencing what's going on in the market. The market is starting to turn away from specifically what's going on in demand and starting to look at the supply side of the balance sheet and what is going to happen with uh, total production when we, have, when we had such a steep drop in planted acres in USDA's uh, planted acreage report in uh, at the start of the month, or excuse me, in June. 
and US, USDA took off 5 million acres of planted, estimated planted acres for corn, uh, which was quite a bit more than uh, what the industry was estimating. So uh, the markets are gonna be turning their attention to the Farm Service Agency and uh, trying to get guidance as to why farmers cut out so many acres and did not plant. And specifically why a lot of those acres were not shifted over to soybeans. Uh, or other crops. There was a lot of uh, acres that were not planted. Uh, so uh, there's some concern, especially when we had a fairly ideal planting, se uh, planting season this year. And so perhaps uh, this COVID environment is having an outside, outsized impact on acreage where the farmers saw uh, corn prices fall so sharply, uh, it just did not pencil uh, a profit. And so they are allowing those acres to perhaps remain idle. Uh, a lot of uncertainty, uncertainty, remember, not so long ago, and we're still deal dealing with uncertainty, but in the midst of this slide, when corn futures were falling so sharply, it caused probably a lot of discouragement that perhaps there would be no return of ethanol demand. And so there were some a number of farmers perhaps who decided it's just not worth it. And so that is one reason perhaps why we are seeing uh, some concern there on total production and why prices are uh, rising. Uh, but at the same time now, um, again, uh, on the supply side of the balance sheet, we're looking at what's going on with weather. It's very hot and very dry. Now in some parts of the Midwest, uh, there are some rains forecast. Now there's some areas in the Eastern Corn Belt I know that is expected to get a half inch to an inch of rain perhaps this weekend. We'll see what happens. The markets are very, are very keen on what happens uh, within the, in the next week, especially as the crop is moving into the very important pollination period. Uh, now it's at the very early stages of pollination, uh, but in the next uh, week to two weeks, uh, really in the next two to three weeks, um, a large chunk of the crop is gonna be in that very vulnerable spot uh, where pollination uh, is very important and it needs to have that, those cool temperatures. And when we're seeing these extremely hot and dry temp or conditions, uh, that's not going to bode well for yield. So we got two things going on. Uh, a big drop in planted acreage. Perhaps farmers were just very discouraged uh, over what was uh, on the demand side of the balance sheet. And now we're seeing that collide uh, with weather concerns all across uh, the Midwest. And so that is pulling up corn prices and that is also supporting uh, at the same time, uh, soybean prices, as we all know, in the markets, rising tides float all boats. And so in the ag markets, corn is, has helped lift uh, soybean values. A little bit deeper dive on ethanol here. Uh, this is grain crushings for ethanol or for fuel uh, alcohol. Uh, as you can see there, uh, total crushings in April really took a dive. Uh, that was a significant drop. It was uh, almost half, not quite half of what, uh, where we were uh, the year prior. Uh, this is the latest da data that we have from USDA. So it doesn't have, we don't have June data yet, but as you can see, uh, grain crushings for ethanol are recovering. And now when you look at the latest data from EIA, uh, the Energy Information uh, Administration, we've got uh, ethanol uh, production continues to improve, but the numbers are starting to turn a little bearish. Uh, for the first time since April, we saw ethanol, excuse me, ethanol inventories increase. So this goes back to what Dan had mentioned earlier. Uh, when we're talking about uh, specifically with COVID-19 and the reopening of the economy, there are three states in particular we are very concerned about. It's California, Texas, and Florida. These are very large uh, economies. And, and when we have a resurgence of uh, COVID-19 in these very big economies, uh, not only do you have to be concerned about what may happen with state uh, and local policies about, uh, about, uh, dr about consumers congregating or driving or traveling uh, and uh, social distancing, but you just have basic consumer psychology is now a concern. Are people really uh, uh, prepared to leave their home like they used to or, or like they were hoping to? This is going to impact energy consumption and fuel consumption. So although we are seeing a recovery in ethanol production, uh, it's not to the level right now where USDA is projected uh, for, for the year. So uh, something that we're gonna be watching here in the weeks and months ahead, uh, and we're, uh, we, 
just came out with a report not so long ago by Ken Zuckerberg uh, here at CoBank about where we see the ethanol sector uh, really in the long view uh, in the next uh, two to three years. And our view is that uh, we are at a, a permanent adjustment, uh, that we will not be going back to those prior levels, uh, those pre-COVID-19 levels of ethanol production and corn consumption. Uh, we're, fact, we're looking at around that 80 to 90 percent uh, level, and I think that is where a lot of the industry is right now as well, so I think we're in line there. Uh, but when you see these resurgence uh, in some major economies like California, Texas, and Florida, uh, you start to look at those numbers a little bit more closely, and perhaps uh, we may need to take off a little bit more on the, the demand side of the balance sheet for corn to account for still lower ethanol consumption. On the export front, as you can see here, uh, this is looking at export sales uh, for the marketing year. So looking at uh, since harvest uh, began October 1 um, and going, excuse me, SEP 1 going forward. And uh, you can see there corn exports down 21%. Now this goes again back to what's going on in the macro economy. The strong dollar uh, is a problem, but we also had strong competition coming out of South America uh, and the former Soviet Union. Uh, looking forward, we're still seeing more competition coming out of Brazil. I think CONAB is looking at the Brazilian corn crop, uh, just a little over 100 million metric tons. Uh, and uh, when they've got a very cheap real and they've got a lot of economic problems down there as well, that's going to continue to weigh on their currencies uh, or their currency, the real, that's going to uh, give them an extra tailwind uh, in the export market. And uh, that's going to be a problem uh, for us going forward for our export program. Uh, looking at corn outstanding sales, as you can see there are quite a bit uh, year, increase year over year. Those are sales still on the books yet to be exported. And uh, that's a concern when you've got such a high level that's still sitting on the books. Uh, those sales can be switched over to other destinations like Brazil and uh, Ukraine. Soybean exports down 1%. Uh, now keep this in context. Even though we're almost steady with last year, especially with China having increased their imports, uh, we're still down uh, from pre or excuse me, pre-trade war levels. So although we are moving in the right direction, as Dan indicated earlier, we are a far cry from meeting uh, the phase one agreement levels and uh, reading, uh, meet, meeting those or exceeding uh, the pre-trade war levels. Uh, soybean outstanding sales, the positive note here is that's down 27% year over year. Um, in terms of what is at risk of not being shipped. Uh, now the concern though here is that since those sales are not on the books, uh, there are, they are eyeing a very big, uh, more plantings uh, really down in South America. The question going forward is what will the Chinese be buying this fall uh, if they've been uh, stockpiling uh, in the first half of the year, how much appetite will they have for soybeans in the second half of 2020 as uh, the US soybean crop comes online? Uh, that remains to be seen, uh, but we do know that uh, we are concerned about uh, the uh, political environment uh, with China and the U.S., and uh, the Chinese have voiced their displeasure with the U.S. Uh, with uh, issues such as Hong Kong and Taiwan, and uh, they have done a little bit of saber rattling behind the scenes and indicated this is not how you treat us when we are the ones trying to buy from you. So we'll see uh, what happens uh, with their exp export pace going, or import rather, uh, pace uh, from the U.S. going forward. Rounding it out here with a few uh, comments on wheat. Uh, wheat is in the throes of harvest, and that is uh, we are seeing new supplies enter the marketplace. As it relates to COVID-19, we de did see some basis pop uh, in some areas uh, of Kansas and the Great Plains, especially with uh, feed mills, excuse me, uh, flour mills uh, had an increased basis uh, because of spikes in demand. And we continue to see very strong flour sales and that's supporting basis in these areas where you have uh, flour mills. Uh, but as you look at what's going on right now, prices uh, long-term still uh, are down uh, from the peak in March or the near-term peak in March. Uh, we'll see where this goes forward because we are seeing some concerns over in the FSU area and the Black Sea region with uh, some stress uh, with uh, uh, the Russian crop and perhaps some export quotas there as well. So. Uh, there might be some upside here potential with wheat. 
Wheat exports, uh, HRW exports down 22%. Uh, spring uh, wheat exports up 20%. And uh, that's, uh, we've uh, benefited there uh, mostly with uh, Southeast Asia, especially on spring wheat, uh, on the spring wheat crop, uh, but especially with uh, HRW sales down 22%, this is a little concerning. Um, perhaps we might see this change going forward if we see some uh, uh, export uh, capabilities reduced out of the Black Sea region. And rounding it off before I hand it over to our lead economist for animal protein, Will Sawyer, just to look at what's going on uh, with total exports to uh, grain exports to China. Again, tying this back to Dan, remember, the trade war has not uh, disappeared yet. Uh, COVID-19 has really taken the headlines, but this issue has not gone away. And as you look at uh, these combined export totals for soybeans, grain, sorghum, wheat, and corn, we are a far cry from re reaching the pre-trade war levels that we saw like in 2017. In fact, we're about 50% down uh, from that level on total tonnage exported. So one thing that, again, that we will be watching, uh, and so much of that is political, and uh, with the Chinese uh, signaling that they want to uh, continue phase one purchases only if we start behaving according to uh, their policy initiatives. and. Uh, We'll see what happens with an election year. So with that, I will hand it over to Will Sawyer. Thank you, Tanner. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Will Sawyer. I'm the lead economist here at CoBank covering the animal protein sector. Um, before we, we got on the line um, this afternoon, Kate and I were reflecting on how far the protein markets have come the last time uh, we were we were on the webinar at, at the end of April. Um, you know, at at this point, whether we're talking about the protein sector or the general economy, you know, we're spending a lot of time talking about recovery. How much have we recovered? Or are we going to continue to recover? And obviously, with with uh, Dan's comments, there are starting to be some signals of some slowdowns when it comes to recovery. Um, but whenever I start a presentation for the protein sector, I kind of try to, to map out all the moving parts as it relates to animal protein and all the different shapes of, of recovery um, that, that we are seeing today. And, and over the last few months, I've moved these bubbles in and out of different shapes. Um, and we're going to talk about in the next few minutes about how those bubbles, I think, may be moving over the next few months. Uh, I won't cover them all, of course, I don't have time for that, um, but we're going to cover uh, a good number of them. So let's, let's get right into it when it comes to supply. Um, if you think back to a few months ago when we were on the webinar, protein supply was at its official bottom. Red meat production was down 35% uh, versus prior year levels. Uh, chicken was holding in there pretty close to prior year levels, but overall meat supply in the U.S. was down about 20%. That was a convenient bottom. Um, since then, as you can tell very clearly, protein supply has come back. Um, and if you think about that time frame of the end of April to today, a few things have happened, very important things. Um, the first thing is that President Trump placed the meat industry under the Defense Production Act. That allowed a lot of meat plants that would have closed in, in May to remain open. That allowed the two dozen meat plants that had closed over the course of April to reopen, um, and it allowed uh, consistency in the regulations that meat uh, producers and processors were experiencing, whether that be state regulations or national organizations. And so that's been a, a huge, a huge change. Change, and as a result, you can see over the course of May and June, uh, protein supplies more than came back. Uh, we got to the point where we were following this on a daily basis, and we really watched the meat industry get back to normal far more quickly than I think we would have expected, really anyone would have expected. And in fact, when you look at the, the last week of June, you see uh, red meat production, especially on the pork side of things, up double digits. Who would have thought um, over the course of two months we could see that much change? And where we are today is that overall in 2020, we have seen, despite the disruptions of April and May, meat supplies that are up above uh, prior year levels. And, as you, and where we are over the, the last couple of weeks, we're going to continue to see meat supply growth, I think, overall, but there will be some moving parts that we'll talk about. So growth is, is back upon us, as you saw um, in the first few months of, of the year. 
So as supplies have returned to normal, so have prices. Um, unfortunately for processors and producers, the, the high uh, pork and beef prices of early to mid-April are very much something of the past. I am very um, curious to see that today meat prices, especially on the beef and pork side, are largely where they were prior to, to um, the COVID outbreak across the U.S. or in the meat industry. Uh, it's almost as if we've come full circle, but as we know, uh, demand has done anything but come for full circle, but meat prices today are in that level. When we think about um, the rest of, of uh, July and as we kind of go through the next few months, of the third quarter, we're very much going to test those prices. And it's gonna be very interesting how those lower prices, I think, are gonna impact both producers and processors. But from a profitability standpoint, we do see prices um, back to where they were pre-COVID levels. That's been quite a roller coaster from the, the lows of mid, uh, mid to late April to the highs just a month later. Trying to forecast this market has been anything but easy, uh, but, but let's try to think about the, uh, the next few months. Um, the first variable we need to think about, not just from a 2020 standpoint, but from a, from a global standpoint, is food service demand. That is the most important issue in my mind for the meat industry. And you can see that while the full service or the counter service or limited service restaurants saw a huge rebound uh, from late March all the way through uh, most of June, that rebound has very much slowed over the last couple of weeks to a very concerning level. You know, obviously we want to see that blue line um, much closer to the, the orange level that we saw this time last year, because this is a really important time for meat consumption. Folks are supposed to be on the road, going to, um, to the beach, going on vacation, and meat consumption is as good as it's going to get, unfortunately, this time of year. Um, but we're starting to see that plateauing. And as Dan said, I think the spread of COVID cases nationally has caused a lot of consumers to not continue that, that level of improvement in food service demand. And so when we think about the next couple months, this chart does, I think, really dictate a, a good portion of the future for prices, uh, whether we're talking beef, pork, or chicken. But let's first start, uh, start the conversation with uh, profit margins on the beef side of things. Um, it's really been a tale of two cities. I know I hate to use that cliche, but it really has been. Um, whether you're on the processing side, it's been the best of times. And, and uh, producers, it's been some of the worst of times. Uh, you know, cattle feeders are there in the blue. Uh, we've been in this situation before where cash margins have been very much in the red. Um, if we think back to just about this time last year, there was a huge plant fire in Kansas and a beef plant, and that caused some huge uh, dislocation between producer profitability and processor profitability. We are in that same period today, but what's unfortunate is that it seems as though what was just a relatively short-term issue this time last year, it does seem that this is going to be an issue that the beef industry is going to struggle with for the remainder of, of 2020. What's that going to cause? Well, you know, the, uh, the most – Quick conclusion to oversupply is obviously um, a reduction in uh, in the herd. I think that's something that's going to be um, not a question of if, but when and to what degree, because we are seeing um, processor margins at relatively high levels, but producers are very much in the red. I think one thing that we have to acknowledge here with this green line is that processor costs are up significantly versus normal, probably 100 to 150% above what we consider a normal uh, beef packing processing cost. That's the PP&E. That's the, the increased wages and the bonuses. Some of those things are going to go away, but uh, many of them are going to remain. And so processing on the beef side of things is not going to be uh, as as uh, as good as this uh, chart might indicate um, going forward. Pork, it's a little bit of a, of a similar story, but some very unique differences. Um, I think while we do see this tale of two cities between processors and producers, on the pork side of things, you see many producers who are at least partially owners of, of pork plants or at least have a, a contract that exposes them to the margins within the plant. And so it's, you know, there's a number of pork producers that haven't fared nearly as bad as, as this chart might indicate. But then there's the other producers. The independent hog producers have seen margins significantly worse than this. 
$100 per head, $150 per head. And you can tell by the futures market, the, the worst may be yet to come. And that's something that we, again, makes us think about contraction in the uh, in the pork supply as well. What does that mean for producers and processors? Um, that's something that we're going to see play out over the next few months. Uh, let's not forget the um, our two-legged uh, sector on the poultry side. These margins have seen the volatility, uh, don't get me wrong, but it's been far more quiet of a story on the chicken sector. There's a few reasons for that. Obviously, the chicken sector can ebb and flow its supply far more easily than the red meat side can, but at the same time, their food service sales have done significantly better. If we go to a McDonald's or a Chick-fil-A or any of the fried chicken chains, those folks that have a drive through window are doing so much better than those that are very more uh, sit-down focused. That's been to the benefit of the poultry sector and obviously to the, uh, to the demise for, for the red meat. Where we are today, as you can see, margins are overall in the black, but a real fraction of where they would be normally for what's supposed to be the most seasonally profitable time of year. That doesn't bode well for the fall and the winter when margins, at least historically, do see more pressure than where we are today. And so when you wrap all of this, I know not very uh, rosy outlook, you can see producers are starting to tell us a story of contraction, um, not just for 2020, but going forward, whether it's on the uh, beef, pork or chicken side of things, sow slaughter that reached close to 30% above prior levels. You can see that there in the um, in the green, you see cattle placements that were down 20 to 25% below prior year levels. And of course, we all know that the chicken sector, once margins do start to normalize, they're going to get back on the supply growth side of things. It does seem like uh, that that's going to be somewhat of a inevitability, uh, the possibility of oversupply there again in, in the third quarter as their margins, as I said in the previous slide, aren't as poor as what you see on the red meat side of things. But I think all in all, red meat supply and I think going forward, maybe a plateauing on the chicken side of things, meat production in the US has probably seen its peak uh, over the course of the last few quarters, if not just in, in 2019. And so I will end my, uh, my prepared remarks in the same place as Tanner and Dan with China. Again, something that we can't um, overstate the importance. Uh, and, and as you know, this chart goes back a little further than most of my charts. And there's a reason for that. And it's to remind us that while China has really saved our, I'm not going to say bacon, saved our skin in 2020, um, it's been a, a customer that has come and gone more than a few times over the last 20 years, whether it's during the Olympics in 2008, uh, whether it's in 2011. China's come into the market, bought huge volumes of beef, pork, and chicken. And you can see here in the last few months, um, pork and poultry from the U.S. have sent, have sent uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds over, um, over the first five months of the year. But the numbers, I think, are something for us to remember. Um, in the first five months of the year, China accounted for almost 30% of all of our animal protein exports. And so when you think about it as a customer, you know, China is accounting for about 6% of all the meat that's being produced in the U.S. today. And so as China rebuilds its hog herd and maybe its economy doesn't grow as quickly as it has in the last 10 years, what that means to the meat industry is something that we need to think about uh, going forward. So I will leave it there. Don't know if I'm sending it back to Dan or, or Kate, but I uh, appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you all. Thanks, Will. Just uh, a couple words on dairy before we open it up for, for Q&A. See if we can get this to advance. There we go. All right. So the big story, you know, really in agriculture has been the resurgence in dairy prices. And it's not been across the board. It's really been, uh, it's been all, kind of all over the place. If you look at powder and, and butter and, and uh, different things, uh, different uh, slices and different varieties within those, Cheese has been the standout. It has been absolutely amazing. Prices have just surged in a better V shape than you could have, you could have hoped for. Uh, so class three is prices have just skyrocketed. We're up around $22, $23 per hundred weight. Uh, they won't stay there. Uh, as you can see below there, you see the futures prices curves, the expectation of where they will uh, really come together as we go out into the fall. 
uh, and settle in somewhere around $16. Um, butter prices have come up, but then kind of flattened out. So we're not seeing as much activity. They're not going to skyrocket uh, the way the butter did. Uh, and that's that's class four. So you're not getting as much strength as class four. It's still down around $14, $15. Um, you know, so it's easy to look at class three because it's the one that most people refer to and say, gosh, it's going to be fantastic for, for dairy farmers. They all should be, you know, getting paid back a lot of what they lost. It doesn't really work that way. It's a very complicated pricing system. And so class three is only an element of what farmers actually get paid. Um, and so margins, based on what we can see, margins will be positive through the, the end of the year, about $3 a hundred weight. But um, it's going to vary, obviously, over time here um, by region. You can see it down there in the bottom right, California, Idaho, New Mexico, New York, Wisconsin have very different cost structures. Um, but, you know, it looks positive. And I, and I think given where we've been over the last few months, I would take that. Will we start ramping back up and producing more milk? Almost certainly. Um, there are enough heifers out there that we could start to rebuild the herd and increase the, the level of, of milk output. But based on the numbers that we've seen from the January USDA report uh, on, on cattle, on what's available, um, it's unlikely that we're actually going to be able to increase milk production enough to drive everything back down into the red where, where margins are negative. So I think things are, are looking pretty good, cautiously good for the remainder of the year. Uh, where some some wounds can be healed, uh, it's not going to be dramatically great. It's going to be pretty good and much better than what any of us would have expected back in April. So this is the positive story. Um, you know, going back, we've been telling this story for a while. Um, really, what caused this was the the cheese manufacturers really held back in the worst in the worst of the COVID shutdown and just refused to process cheese. We saw an awful lot of dumping of milk in April and a little bit into May. Uh, it made all the difference. It was painful then, but it's paying off now that um, that the supply of milk is is about where it should be. There isn't this massive oversupply, and uh, unfortunately, we got a, a fair amount of imports of butter that from mostly from Europe, mostly from Ireland, uh, back in April into May, uh, and mostly May at a time when we really didn't need it because we had butter stocks rebuilding, and so. Some of that was disruption in the supply chain. It was most of the butter that was available was available for food service. It was available in large packaging. And, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a disruption there. And so Ireland, you know, jumped on it. I think somewhere in the range of 85% of the butter that came in in May from Europe was from Ireland. They had it sitting ready to go and they flooded the market. Americans go to the grocery store and they say, oh, this is a premium product. Let's, let's buy this up. Um, they're willing to pay a little bit more. There is a tariff on it, but they paid it anyway. And so we're left with, with I think if that didn't happen, if you didn't have that sequence, you probably would have had butter prices rise a little bit closer to where cheese, cheese had gone. Um, this is the dynamics of the market. This is part of being an open market where Europe was dealing with the same thing we were dealing with and probably had too much, too much dairy product of their own. So Anyway, there's all sorts of things that, that could pop up uh, between now and, and this fall to uh, change this projection, but this is what it looks like that at least uh, uh, the dairy industry will, will be relatively healthy uh, versus where they were and uh, be able to stay above, above that, uh, stay in the black instead of going back down to the red. So let me pause there. Um, we've got a little bit of time left. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Kate, and see if you want to handle questions that, that, that might have come in. I do indeed. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you ended on a positive note. Uh, <laughs> there are so few, I think, uh, positive things that we can focus on that it's nice to, to have one. Um, but I, I do feel really badly. I bought some Kerrygold butter. Um, <laughs> sorry about it, everybody. <laughs> Um, one thing that I just to kick this off I I'll tell a personal anecdote I'm here in New York City and um, indoor dining has been postponed indefinitely it is now no longer included in any phase of our reopening um, they're just not going to allow it Dr. Burks in the task force briefing today mentioned that just all indoor activity just seems to be um, you know the most dangerous 
So I guess my question is in, in this outlook for food service, maybe Will, you wanna take this one or you can all probably chime in on it, but in terms of the outlook for food service, what happens in the winter when outdoor dining is just simply not an option and we're told we can't do it indoors? Like I'm just like, these projections are all fine and good when it's 80 degrees outside. I'm, are there any right. ideas about what this might look like in wintertime? Well, and I don't think there's a lot of drive through windows in Manhattan either, <laughs> if I true. remember <laughs> correctly. Yeah, it, it is, um, you know, changing that, um, changing the food service algorithm to basically dining out of the restaurant um, is, is basically wh where the industry is going to need to go. So whether that's Grubhub or Uber Eats, um, having you know, having the convenience isn't going to be something the consumer is going to be willing to give up, though. You know, I don't think our cooking skills as uh, Americans have just overnight become to the level where we can just rely on ourselves um, for TV dinners um, every every meal. And so I think restaurants are going to need to get very creative in the way that they provide the experience the experience and the convenience of dining out without, as you said, being able to dine in the restaurant. Um, I think the, uh, the, you know, the Uber, and I guess it was the Grubhub transaction of the last um, couple of weeks, I think is, is probably indicative of that. But I think a lot of restaurants themselves are going to get a lot more creative and how they can try to translate what is a higher dollar experience um, to a, a consumer who's probably asking themselves if I'm, you know, if I'm spending 30 or $40, but I'm eating out of styrofoam, does it really, am I really getting that value? That's going to be a, a hard translation to make. I think when it comes to food consumption, the weakness in food service is going to be a, a challenge that can be the, the kind of COVID um, aftershock that's going to take us a long time um, to fully get over because so much of the, of the industry, at least I can speak for the meat industry, is focused on food service. Um, and to make matters even worse is that some of the, the companies within the industry are very, very focused on food service, especially in the poultry sector, where there are some companies where three quarters of their business model has been focused on food service. And, um, and those are going to be difficult transi transitions to make for those companies. Um, but uh, it seems like everybody's going to be making transitions, so they, so they won't be alone. Right. And we have another attendee sort of asking – saying that the retail restaurants um, are, are going to have to increase their prices to deal with their legal responsibilities in this time. And, and to your point of, is it as great to eat my $40 meal out of styrofoam, you know, how, and a lot of people are operating on pay cuts of their own, you know, how much increased pricing right. can the consumer bear? Well, you know, one thing that's, that's helped is that since we've not been going out as much and traveling as much, you know, we've all seen that, that savings rate chart go, um, go crazy. I don't know how long that's going to last when these unemployment benefits roll off here in a few weeks. Um, but I, I think with that in mind, you know, when you look at retail, um, again, in the meat case, retail inflation has been 15 to 20%, depending on your species. That's, that's inflation. That's, that's pretty uh, significant, but, Again, when you know you have the ability to to have that dining experience um, at home, and you you translate that food product into your own um, at home dining experience, you're willing and actually able to pay more, right? Um, I don't know how long folks are going to be and willing to do that. It was interestingly interesting when we saw the the Father's Day data. Um, we saw that the meat case had thirty to forty percent. Um, growth. So I, I don't think that's because meat supplies have, you know, are up by that percentage. I think it's just that you have a lot of, obviously in this case, dads who are wanting to have that dining experience. And so they're out there buying that steak um, in a way they wouldn't have normally. So we're all trying to get a little sense. But when it comes to inflation for the restaurant sector, um, we are going to lose, and we already have been thousands of, of family owned restaurants. Um, I think the publicly traded um, restaurant sector are going to be the survivors. And so it's the independents um, that are going to be falling by the wayside. And that's, 
And that's one area that we see as a common trend in the food sector is that the independent producer that's one link in the supply chain doesn't have the diversity of geography or um, of vertical integration. There are going to be uh, some of the more uh, hard pressed as, as this kind of saga of COVID continues to go on, I think, as we go through the third quarter and, and maybe into 2021. Yeah. I think you're, I think you're correct. Um, Dan, from your chart about government support, we had a question come up a couple weeks ago in, in a different session um, about do we have any data on um, how much government support is being issued by other countries competitive to us in the export markets? Like, um, do we have any idea about government spending into the sector outside the U.S.? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure that data is out there. Um, I don't know how updated it is. We probably don't have access to 2020 data. My guess is that it goes through the WTO process, uh, and they probably don't, a lot of countries don't make that public. Mm -hmm. They make it, they present it when they need to. So I don't think it's readily available, but it's probably out there maybe a couple years old. Uh, but that is, uh, you know, we've already heard complaints uh, of, of competing countries saying they're going to go to the WTO and say, hey, you are outside of the bounds of what you are legally allowed to do as part of the WTO, that we, we are, it's not even close, that we're outside of it. And then the, the administration is saying, hey, the way that we classified all these things, it's going to be fine. But a lot of analysts that, that know this space very closely are saying, if we get called on it, it's going to take a couple of years and we'll end up having to pay something back or support, just similar to what we did with the cotton situation a few years ago, and just support support something, pay something back, because once once they the, the claim goes through the WTO, they will get permission to uh, to strike back. And um, you know, that's the that's the point when we always do something when the when it comes back on us and it could be spread across not just agriculture, but the pain could go across different sectors in, in the US. Right. Um I'm going to stick with you, Dan, for just a second. PJ has a question. Can you talk about what the impact of negative PPDs will do for the dairy sector in the coming months? Negative PPDs. Yes. I don't know what it means. I thought you would. <laughs> I probably should. Um, <laughs> well, we wrote briefly on it in our quarterly. Um, oh, Tanner? You, okay, you, Tanner, you can, you can take that one. We, we kind of, we tandem dairy right now okay. until we have a dairy analyst, so. Tanner, why don't you so, take it? Yeah, so in regards to PPDs, it's uh, it's an oddity. It only happens about 15% of the time, so it's a very short-term thing. But what happened was uh, you've got class one milk, which is uh, determined by the components of, the, of your manufacturing milks. And because you had surge, and like Dan was talking earlier, class three milk for, uh, futures went through the roof, and then you had a differential there where um, uh, it, it exceeded class one. And so you've got a, uh, a about a four to $8 uh, negative uh, differential their PPD. And so a lot of uh, milk producers are going to be getting uh, a lot smaller checks. They're not going to be realizing $22 milk or something like that. It's going to be smaller. Uh, it's a temporary thing. It's going to get worked out. Uh, if milk prices hold uh, over time, that will correct. Uh, but it, uh, we could be uh, seeing uh, this negative PPD for a little while, and uh, if, if if the market does not hold. Okay, thank Thanks, you for Tanner. that. <laughs> good save, good save. Um, how about in terms of crops that are are not covered as much on the, you know, commodity trade side? What about outlook for specialty crops um, and, and permanent? So there. Do you have any data on where those have been moving as as the COVID supply chain? Because I I'm thinking about the direct to consumer meals. That was one of the the winning bubbles on Will's slide. Um, you know, so all of these companies that deliver these fresh, uh, ready to make meal products, um, you know, have an incredible array of, of produce, obviously. I was wondering if there is any increased spend on, um, you know, uh, for, well, for the direct to consumer market on specialty or 
credit. Yeah, can't we touch on that again on our uh, quarterly that we'll be coming out with shortly? And uh, they're going to be a, a special crops is going to be affected by a lot of the same thing that uh, will sector is affected by. If uh, somebody was heavily contracted to food service, uh, that's been not such a great story over the last quarter. Um, but as for going forward, what is the, you know, how does how do the how does the consumer adjust in this environment? Uh, one thing that we've noticed, let's take blueberries, for instance, um, you know, you would have figured uh, that there would have been a surge in frozen blueberry demand, and there was. Uh, and they, and the, 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 wonder, or the, the question is, is this a turning point because consumers for many, many years now continued to shift over to fresh, right, uh, and away from frozen? Well, in this pandemic environment, uh, frozen sales have gone up. However, um, we still have a lot of inventory out there, frozen uh, blueberries, for instance, and it's not enough to justify investing in a new frozen facility. So is it really turning a corner? Is the consumer adopting a new behavior uh, that is fundamentally changing the industry? It may not be uh, because uh, that trend is still very strong. Consumers want fresh. And so um, we'll, we'll gather some more data over time. Uh, but this has been a long-term concern that uh, if you're in the specialty crop sector and you've been selling frozen and you've been watching your sales go down over, over, a, year, over a period of years, and now you're looking at an opportunity here to, uh, to maybe sell more frozen, well, is, that, is it going to stick? Right. Uh, that's a big question and um, it's good for now, but it doesn't look like it's going to be uh, to the degree it's going to shift it permanently uh, back to where consumers want more frozen again, more than they did fresh. Mm -hmm. And then Timothy's asking just to follow on on this, uh, on the permanent crop side, almonds and pistachios and others have huge import, export components, sorry. Um, what are your thoughts on the trends here going forward? Anyone yeah, for Trina? Yeah, we've, uh, well, we've, we're exposed to uh, the tree nut sector and um, we've got a mega crop uh, coming uh, very soon. It's going to be on, on almonds, it's going to be about a 3 billion pound crop, it's the highest ever. And 60% uh, of that crop is exported typically, and with China and India being the major markets there. And we still have retaliatory, they still have retaliatory tariffs on, in place on us. Uh, in the midst of a weakening global demand when uh, consumers are stressed globally. So uh, that'll be an interesting environment where we've got a lot of uh, uh, tree nut sur or surplus and tree nut inventories and we're dealing with a struggling global economy and retali retaliatory tariffs still in place. Uh, I know that almond prices have come back quite a bit uh, since January. Um, is, are they going to fall even more? there's no bullish indicator that they would go up. I'll say that. Okay. Um, and I think we'll just do two more. Uh, I know we, we started a little late, so we'll, we'll run a little late if that's okay with you guys. Um, Carl's asking, what is your view on China's recent requirement for signed declaration that some food imports are guaranteed coronavirus free? I had not heard that. I think that's bizarre, but um, numerous Brazilian meat plants have apparently been banned already. Um, but Carl thinks that only one U.S. plant. Um, is that an obstacle to phase one? Do you guys know anything about that? Um, yeah, I do know. Um, well, I know two more than I would prefer on that on that issue, I guess. I, I wish it wasn't an issue. I, I wish it wasn't the situation. I think, you know, we, um, it's, uh, what's the game? It's a shell game. It's a whack-a-mole game uh, when it comes to the trade of uh, food into into uh, certain markets around the world. Um, and I think as we try to address one issue, another issue comes up. So whether it's ractopamine or avian flu or beta agonists or um, what have you, there's always going to be an issue that keeps U.S. food from finding its way into certain markets. Um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting strategy to use COVID as a <clears throat> as a barrier to entry for U.S. protein, and whether that's um, and whether that's beef, pork, or chicken, I think that's a card that they may very well be played um, because, in a very interesting way, 
um, it would pass the buck of who is driving the spread of coronavirus in a very hard to defend perspective. So um, we saw this happen with ractopamine a number of years ago. I wouldn't be surpri surprised to see it pop up with COVID. I do think positive here, Kate, for you, um, is that it's been very and very important that the industry associations and the USDA have been very clear and very supportive of the industry to say, you do not need to attest to your product being COVID free. As we know, uh, meat cannot be uh, as a, a conduit for the virus. And so attesting to that is in no way required or necessary. And so the meat industry has done that, thankfully. Uh, not that we don't have other challenges right now, but I'm glad to, to, to see that. Hopefully I, I got through that political one easily. <laughs> very, very well done. Very adept. Okay. Well, and, that, and that came on the, oh, sorry. if I can just finish up on yeah. Will's thought, that came on the back of China rejecting a bunch of uh, farm-raised salmon from Chile. And they were, there was the concern here a few weeks ago that that, that, ch that salmon was carrying coronavirus and, and they rejected all of that. And so how much of the political issues were in that, how much of that was a setup to be able to do it with everyone else? Like you said, Will, it could be uh, just one more uh, one more uh, barrier that they can put up with with phytosanitary and those those types of things. Yeah. Okay. Leanne has a good one that uh, I think will be a good one to end on, um, and I'll have each of you address it. Um, when you think about winners and losers in broad commodities from the stay-at-home economy, what are the top three? She is referencing that you already pinpointed Darius, maybe someone who's coming out well, but if you guys could give some some winners and losers. As a as a way to wrap up, Tanner, gonna make you go first. <laughs> uh, so I'll uh, say that um, shelf stable product, products like tree nuts have been a winner. Uh, so uh, it's a good source of protein uh, and it's shelf stable. So as more people eat at home, uh, and instead of going out to restaurants, they're going to gravitate to those type of uh, snacks. Um, you know, your canned, especially crops, you know, canned uh, green beans, canned corn, you name it. Uh, that has also been a huge positive. Uh, I'd say a hit has been to the fresh, uh, especially a uh, fresh market for uh, especially crops. And again, uh, reiterating uh, anyone who's got ex uh, any exposure to food service, uh, they're trying to find or continuing to find a, find a way to get into the home market uh, through retail. And that's not an easy chore. So really anyone who's, who's got those easy, easily, um, the shelf stable products at the grocery store, those are easy winners. And I'll go next. I would, <laughs> okay. I would say my, my, my winners would be first on the wheat side. Um, we, we saw it's been covering off a lot of the mainstream media of, of uh, folks baking an awful lot more at home, baking bread, doing those sorts of things. So that's counteracted a lot of the, the loss of, of baking uh, outside of the home. Um, we, I do have a friend that works uh, at one of the, one of the large um, suppliers of flour, a lot of mills all over the North America. Uh, and they have had to run for, for months on end at a, at a pace that they normally only run uh, leading up to the holidays. And so that's been, the business has been really good in that, that sector. Uh, the other one was rice up until very recently, right? Tanner, Tanner covers the rice sector well, uh, just on a lot of fears of um, uh, that, that we're going to have food shortages and not enough and everybody's going to start hoarding in other parts of the world. Uh, and that influenced very positively, influenced our rice, rice growers if they were able to capture those prices. Uh, that was really good for them. Uh, and, and within dairy, I would say specifically fluid milk. I mean, fluid milk, has been the dog for, for years and years of just plain 2% or skim or 1%. It's just, it's going down, you know, significant single digits every year of what's being consumed. And that's reversed during COVID-19, that with its buddy cereal. They're both being consumed a lot more in the mornings when people are, have time to sit down with their laptop while they haven't gotten changed and maybe feeding their, their children that they normally don't have time to do. Uh, so that's certainly a benefit. We're eating very differently. 
and uh, it's it's benefiting some of the traditional foods that we've left behind years ago with our busy lifestyles. So uh, CPG has definitely benefited from that, uh, and so has a lot of dairy products. All right, Will. I I can't beat those. I, you I think can't. The, they were very good. <clears throat> if I, those are too good. If I had to pick one protein that's going to do um, pr- better in a stay home, it's probably eggs uh, because beef, pork, and chicken have – not that eggs don't have their fair share of food service, but um, I, I think the eggs of, of your – animal true animal proteins eggs are are probably in the best of of some not very good boats okay very good i think that's a great spot for us to wrap up we are so grateful to you as we always are we are very very lucky to have good friends at the knowledge exchange and we're so grateful for all of your insights this was a, i think very useful presentation um everyone who's listening this will go up onto the GAI website along with part one from April. It's an interesting back-to-back watch, highly recommend. Um, but thank you guys so much, really appreciate it. And I look forward to doing this hopefully again in a few months and maybe the world will look completely different again. And I hope you all stay safe and healthy out there. Thanks, Kate. Thanks so much.